So because of where we're at in our in our study, in our reading our book that we're going through, uh, the terms of modernity and enlightenment have come up quite a bit, and we've kind of gone through it, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of really be moving ahead in my lectures, uh, getting to the to the the rise of modernity, if you will, just because we're we're kind of really touching on it quite a bit. So so this can this lecture wouldn't be for a while, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it now, and hopefully it'll kind of help get you guys a really good overview of really what's called the the theological origins of modernity. So <clears throat> here we go. So modernity was an attempt to find a new metaphysical solution to the question of the nature and relation of God and man in the natural world. It was a series of attempts to constitute a new coherent metaphysics and theology. The idea of modernity was a move away from the ancient distinction of understanding reality and universals. Via Antiqua was the older realist path which saw universals as ultimately real, right? These are things that are above us that are pretty much the ultimate of understanding, right? The beauty, goodness, truth, those kinds of things. Those are universals. There's no way to get around them, and those are what have a, a transcendent status over us, if you will. While the Via Moderna was the newer nominalist path that saw all individual things as real and universals as mere names. That's the term nominalist, nomina meaning name. So these are just names that were given to these things. There wasn't actually a universal concept that we are to be governed by or that basically kind of gave us this foundation. So in these logical distinctions provided the, the schema for a new understanding of time and being. <clears throat> Not B-E-A-N, B-E-I-N-G. This metaphysical shift from how the world was seen was not due to a change in knowledge, but rather a change of understanding time, seeing that time is not a circular, sorry, not as circular and finite, but as linear and infinite. Understanding that change meant as a continuous natural process that free human beings could master and control through the application of science became the way for humanity to become masters of their own world. The rise of modernity was due to a deep-seated belief in human autonomy. We've talked about this a lot. Human autonomy was what got us in trouble in the garden, right? Modernity intended to demonstrate its superiority to its predecessors, so the idea of progress was the extension of this idea of autonomy, which was at the heart of the modern project. And the best hope for revival was through Platonic Christianity to bring a renewal to modern thought. But the origins of modernity lie not in human self-assertion or in reason, but in the great metaphysical and theological structure that marked the end of the medieval world that transformed Europe in the 300 years that separated the medieval from the modern world. Excuse me. This metaphysical change came about due to the idea of nominalism. So basically this is the theory of knowledge that denies the objective reality of universal principles, maintaining that universals are mere concepts with no reality apart from their existence in the mind of the individual. And that's a big part of the modernity project is, is the involvement of reason and rationalism in the mind and, and what we actually define as real and what's what's before us. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it arose in the late medieval time period, as I said. For the nominalist, all real being was individual or particular, and universals were mere fictitious words that did not point to any real universal entities, but were merely signs useful for human understanding. The god of nominalism was unsettling, and that a frighteningly omnipotent god was so far beyond his creatures, posing a constant threat to well to the well-being of humanity. And that is really the ultimate divide of what started modernity, was an omnipotent god, right, that had no personal characteristics to it, right? It was a god of, you know, nominalism, right, just, just sheer power, sheer will, no type of really caring of any sort whatsoever as the God of the Bible truly is, right? Moreover, this God could never be captured in words and consequently could be experienced only as a titanic question that evoked awe and dread. And the God of nominalism stands at the origin of modernity. A man questioned the God of nominalism. <clears throat> Disagreements came about regarding what his priority, sorry, what has priority the human, divine, or the natural. The tension between these three became apparent during the humanistic and reformation movements, and these two great movements were steeped in a battle between nominalism and the modern world. Both accepted the ontological individualism that nominalism predict, proclaimed, <coughs> excuse me, 
but they differed fundamentally about whether man or God was ontically primary, right? It's about ontology again. Who is the upper hand? Is it God or man? The Reformation began with God at the center and viewed man from that perspective. Modernity, however, did not begin with man or God, but that of nature, thus giving rise to naturalism. So God, not man, it's nature, right? It's the world, it's the world before us, and that is what's real, and that has priority. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the nominalist view of God. Excuse me. So the God of nominalism is understood to be indifferent and in that there are no natural or rational standards for good and evil that guide or constrain his will. What is good may be good simply because he wills it. One day evil could be good, one day good could be evil. Nominalism is grounded in unbridled omnipotence, where omnipotence is thought of as what God can do, disassociated from his good moral character. He made God into a tyrant that had no concern for his creatures whatsoever. The God of nominalism revealed that he was no longer the beneficent, no, I can't say that word, beneficent, sorry, beneficent and reasonably predictable God of scholasticism. Now, just so you know on the front end, scholasticism isn't a, isn't a type of theology or a way of, 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 or philosophy. It's actually a, a way of, it's a theological method is what it is, right? So it's a, it's a way of actually doing theology, and unfortunately a lot of people uh, misunderstand that. <laughs> The gap between man and God had greatly widened. God could no longer be understood or influenced by human beings. He simply acted out of freedom and was indifferent to the consequences of his actions. Nominalism presented not only a new vision of God, but also what it meant to be human, placing a greater emphasis, importance excuse me, on the human will. Scotus and Occam, and these are characters that we didn't really talk to about yet because they were they were further back, so I didn't really cover them yet, but they are the ones that were directly behind this radical understanding of the divine will. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they asserted that the freedom of the divine will, I'm sorry, they asserted the radical freedom excuse me, of the divine will, but this gave a new prominence to the human will since humans were made in the image of God. Therefore, being in his image, being like God, they were principally willful rather than rational beings. Such a capacity for free choice had always been imagined playing a role in mundane matters, but Orthodox Christianity denied that humans were free to accept or reject justificatory grace. For many, nominalists, excuse me, <clears throat> humans were truly free. Therefore, they could choose to act in a manner that would increase their chances of salvation. However, the emphasis on human ability to will their own salvation came up against the nominalist understanding of the absolute predestinating will of God. So while their, their doctrine seems open for complete human freedom, their commitment to absolute omnipotence negated it. And again, that's the struggle, right? There is a standpoint that man is free, but when you elevate God to being sheer will that cares nothing for his creatures, that pretty much could just change anything, and there's no universals, right? There's nothing that's actually objective, then really that gap, as I said, becomes much, much wider, and now man wants to get out from underneath that vision of this omnipotent God. In holding to this view of divine determinism, nominalism was able to avoid Pelagianism, but the price was high for the notion of predestination not only relieved humans of all moral responsibility, it also made God responsible for evil. Now, if you don't know, Pelagianism is a guy named Pelagian, and him and, him and Augustine had a kind of a major debate going on about the, the nature of the will, and Pelagian said that basically that man is good, and obviously Augustine came back and said, no, he's not, and that was the kind of the center of the debate. So Pelagian says you can actually, you can do good and earn your own salvation, and ultimately that was the, the big heresy during that time. But, like I said, the, the views of predestination was in a sense made even worse, right? Because it not only re relieved humans of all moral responsibility, it also made God responsible for evil. So you had this kind of, this clash of ideas here. So nominalism ultimately results in a capricious God. The Middle Ages ended being dominated by a nominalist perspective of God. However, scholasticism did not fade away. It was in fact revived on a number of times. A man by the name of Francisco Suarez, excuse me, <coughs> who was Aquinas' greatest offender was ontologically anomalous. Though he supported Thomas, he asserted that individual being, B-E-I-N-G, was a universal, which will have implications later on. Now, Francisco Suarez is an important name because I would say that, again, I'm not a, I'm not a 
a scholastic scholar myself as far as reading these guys, but from what I understand, really, the views of, of Aquinas that the modern world started to not like was actually the views of Suarez that pretty much became accepted as Aquinas. But now that people have been actually going back to Aquinas and reading Aquinas and seeing that, uh, definitely it brought Aquinas into a, into a better light. So um, I don't think we'll get into Suarez later on, but he'll, he'll be in other lectures. But now we're going to move on into humanism. So while the theological battle between Occam and the Pope continued to rage on, again, it's a discussion we're not going to get into, but a new movement was beginning nearby in Avignon. A Florentine exile was beginning a lifelong project that would help define the modern age. His name was Francisco Petrarch. He rejected scholasticism as an overly rationalized method of theology. Again, it's a method of theology. But he was also repulsed by the anomalous, endless arguments about terms and what he saw as mere speculation about divine power. Now, anomalism goes back to the idea of like how many angels can dance on the tip of a nail kind of thing, like something that's really, really stupid. Again, it's completely removed from a proper theological and you know, Christian context. Uh, Petrarch was well aware of the corruption in the church. A renewal was needed that married Christian practice with ancient moral value. He envisioned a new kind of man with new virtues grounded in Christianity, but he wasn't a citizen of a city, state, or republic, but he was a being, whole and complete in himself. Petrarch envisioned that such individuals would surround themselves with friends or join others as citizens, but he was convinced that this could only be effective if humans understood themselves as autonomous individuals first. And this was the ideal that inspired the humanist movement. The idea of humanism was not about putting humans at the center, but rather the individual human being, right? So the individual is the center of this of this movement, and that's stuff that I've been reading, I've already mentioned, right, about the rise and triumph of the modern self here, right? It's about the expressive individualism. So this is where it started, and this is where it kind of culminates uh, in his book, which we see all around us. <clears throat> in this respect, there was a deeper ontological debt to nominalism than to antiquity. Excuse me. For humanism, the individual is not a rational animal standing at the peak of creation. Rather, human beings are characterized by their free will. For there is no natural form or end to the individual, for he is simply not a created will, but he self-creates. That is such an important thing. It's a big difference, right? Because looking at the the um, the manner of antiquity, right? There was man was 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 given form. He was given purpose, right? And so ultimately he was created for that purpose, but here he's saying no, that the individual has the ability to self-create. And we're going to see that later on, really, when it gets to Immanuel Kant about basically the mind actually creates the reality that we see before us. And that's what reality is. That's a whole, uh, that's a whole can of worms there. But anyways, so God grants humans this capacity and they can make themselves into whatever they desire. Now we hear that in our terms now, right? You can do whatever you want to do, right? Go to college. You can be whoever you want to be. Obviously, I can't play professional basketball. So I can't do whatever I desire. I can try to play the sport. But obviously, if I want to be a pro, I wasn't created to do that. I'm not six foot six. I don't have those kind of skills. So obviously, this is a very, it's a very kind of dreamy kind of view of mankind. But obviously, society has bought into it. So and like, and like the nominalist view of God, this man is able to create for himself whatever he wants as an artisan whose greatest work is himself. This view of man became the hope for a new golden age, which continued on and on and was always improving all time. I'm going to adjust myself here a little bit. Okay. For all time, excuse me. So we can see that humanism grew alongside and also out of nominalism, right? So in a sense, you know, absolutes don't actually exist, right? They're just mere names. So when it moves from, I guess you could say, the the divine level, the level of being, and it comes down to humans, in a sense, human reality is also kind of anomalous too, right? Because I'm not now no longer confined to these, these concepts of reality. I can create my own reality. So, it, so humanism offered a solution to the problem of divine omnipotence. It narrowed down the ontological difference between man and God, which helped rectify humanity as one who's in control of himself as an individual, as a willful being 
who was successful because he was made like God. So the the image of God in man becomes, I mean, goes go back to the garden, right? I want to see things as God does, because why I should? Because I think I am God. And I want to do and act like God. So glory, not humility, was this man's goal. The world of nominalism was chaotic, and therefore, this refashioning of humanity was a move to reclaim this world, showing that man can govern himself by his own powers and take control of his own destination. However, humanism was not a secular movement, as many supposed. It was, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry. it was not antagonistic to religion, and it was not a form of atheism. Actually, at its center, it was always considered Christian. And I'm sure a lot of people didn't think about that, but that is where it ultimately started. That's the seeds of it. And actually, that was really a big part of the, of the Reformation, of the humanism. See, in humanism, emphasis is heavier on moral practice over faith or ceremonies, right? So kind of like a lot of, you know, do, 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 not just kind of think and read and kind of have this very, um, I said, this, this, this belief, right? It's about practice, about how you do, how you are as a person. So they acted upon Christian belief, but they wanted to separate themselves from the nominalist revolution. See, nominalist revolution, then it becomes all very speculative, right? And you have these, these high-level academics that are just kind of thinking through these things, and really it, there's no actual moral output, that no, 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 no moral good that comes from it. <clears throat> and this shift, this intellectual movement, was also responsible, was response to nominalism serving as the impetus of the Reformation. Martin Luther, the spirit of the Reformation, originally was an alchemist. But the god of nominalism, who was impenetrable, tormented Luther. You've all heard that story, right? Tormenting him day and night. He didn't know if he was saved or not. Luther's response to the nominalist god was that God saves. Faith alone saves. Okay, he is, I, thought I, I thought I typed that wrong. He accepted the nominal notion of man as a willing being, but he transformed this notion by reconfiguring the relationship of divine and human will. Faith, therefore, according to Luther, is the will to a union with God. It becomes the means for one to know God, but it only comes from God through Scripture. Faith in Scripture, therefore, guarantees salvation. And Luther's redemption of the God of nominalism is that God speaks directly to man through his word. Faith comes by hearing the voice of God. God's power is no longer distant or abstract, but rather is in us and through us. And in this way, Luther was able to transform the terrifying God of nominalism into a power within individual human beings. The Christian is reborn in God because God is born in him. With the redeemed man now becoming the dwelling place of God, man's will conforms to God's will. God becomes the center of the Christian life, of the Christian conscience, I'm sorry, conscience, and of the Christian experience. So as the individual is centralized, right, God comes back into the picture, but he comes back into the individual where God ultimately dwells to be. So it's a definitely a great revolution that really satisfies both of those issues, but obviously there's still more to more at stake. <clears throat> and therefore man can know that God's will is and is no longer left in the darkness as to what God is and who he is. But as the Reformation moved forward, humanism could not sustain its position. Humanism could not uphold a doctrine of strict omnipotence. I mean, it's still the, the bedrock foundation of the God of the Bible is he is omnipotent. And as long as he's um, gosh, I can't speak. As long as he's omnipotent, man doesn't ultimately have that free will. Man could not be completely free to create himself as he pleased. And the Reformation could not, oh, sorry. And these two together were antithetical, creating a paradox where there is no escape. And this sharp disagreement appears in the debate between Erasmus and Luther over the freedom of the bondage of the will. So now we're going to move into the idea of becoming. Now, as we've already talked about, God of the Bible is. The modern view is that he is becoming. So it's a shift in metaphysics as this is all about metaphysics. So, in getting back to the metaphysics of this issue, the scholastic perspective saw God as the highest being in creation as a rational order of beings stretching up to God. But the nominalists saw that each being is radically individual and that God is not a being in the same sense as all created beings. The chasm between God and man still existed, but nobody explored it further. But the great thinker 
Meister Eckhart, who was deeply influenced by Neoplatonism, saw that humans were basically nothing without God. Duh. So in a sense, these beings are God. That's not true, but anyways, that is. God must be in human beings in some way, otherwise without them, they would be pure nothingness. It goes back to, obviously, God as the first cause, right? God is the cause of everything that exists, that we live and move and have our being in him. And so, obviously, the, the problem here is that there's this view of a static God that's separate from man, that man can't know God, and so that is obviously a problem. That has a huge, uh, a huge challenge for a humanistic way of seeing, thinking, excuse me. <clears throat> So, he suggests in a different sense, using nominalist terms, that God is pure willing, pure activity, or pure power in the world, in the world, and it's becoming his divine will, is this God. And in modern terms, we would see this as the world being the ceaseless motion that is determined by the divine will, understood as efficient or mechanical causality. The world is the incarnation, the body of God, and he is in the world as the soul in the body, omnipresent as the motive principle. So a mechanical causality is pretty much the the metaphysic of the of the modern world. That was never the metaphysic of the ancient world. And that's what um, ultimately when people get confused today by thinking about God as first cause and God causing things, everything is thought of as from a mechanical standpoint. You pull this lever, this happens, right? You knock down this domino, this one goes, right? But that is not the way of causality of the ancient world. And unfortunately, that is, that is a big debate right now because people, again, don't like, get into it. They don't understand it that way because why? They don't read the ancients. And that's what we've been doing. We're going through the ancients. <laughs> so, anyways. So, and this marks the beginning of the idea of pantheism or panentheism. So, pantheism is that all is God. And then panentheism is all is in God. So, the end is the end. Pan is all. Theism is God, right? So, pantheism or panentheism. <laughs> Excuse me. Let me get a clean real quick. <sighs> This is the shifting away, again, the, the pantheism or panentheism. This is the shifting away from the metaphysics that was deeply embedded in traditional scholasticism and classical theology. He, speaking of God, is not the ultimate whatness or quiddity. Not quiddity, just the Latin for whatness, but he is not the ultimate whatness or quiddity of all beings, but their howness or becoming. God is now in the world in a new and different sense. To discover the divinely ordered character of the world, it is thus necessary to investigate becoming, which is to say it is necessary to discover the laws governing the motion of all beings. See, now it shifts into looking at nature, right? We understand how the, the world works, right? The, the science is taking off. Uh, the laws of science are taking off. People are starting to discover things. And now we start seeing these kind of mechanical pieces of nature. And that's what becomes really the center of what reality is about. <laughs> So theology and natural science thereby become one and the same. And that is where a lot of modern theology is. I mean, the guy that I did my, my doctoral work on, I mean, he's, he's bought into, um, he, he's a process theist, which actually sees the God and, and nature, God and the world, excuse me, are necessary related. Now, he makes a division between that, that the world is part of God's body, which is where he kind of gets away from the process construct of that. But ultimately, the, the natural world is a big part of the theological world because it's ultimately empirical something that we can see. And so, therefore, that becomes really a, a uh, defining piece of how God works in the world is through that, which is why he's also an evolutionist. <clears throat> Anyways, back on track. So, the, the, the motion of nature, therefore, is the motion of God in nature's laws as the forms and structures of the divine will. Rationalist science thus is theologically grounded not in scripture, but in the deduction of the laws of motion from a transcendental will or freedom. So rather than looking into what was outdated to any sort of traditional authority, reason and scientific discovery led to a focus on becoming. Right? So again, it's moved from scripture, it's going into the empirical world. And that is where, obviously, we want to go back to the Bible and say the Bible is the foundation. And obviously creation is made... Uh, it, you know, it points us back to God. This mindset got away from that. More like, again, the creation is part of God. So doubting everything was the path to certain knowledge. 
in such a perspective, dogma, miracles, and supernatural revelation are excluded, right? So those things in the Bible get eradicated because why? They don't happen in the natural world, so we can't hold to them. Dogma, obviously, is is preferential only, right? Uh, miracles, obviously, we don't see them, they don't happen. Supernatural revelation, we know how the world works now. We don't need to look at that. We, need, we don't need to take that consideration. That's more of an ancient way of thinking. We are now a modern way of thinking. Rational man does not need to look to God or religion for moral absolutes. Rather, he could attain his ends in the world by pure logos, the foundation of reason. So we're seeing the phrase, the word logos being used out of context, focused morally on reason, but the, obviously the, the big miss is that ultimately we can do things by reason because reason comes from God. So the center of the story moved from God to human beings, excuse me, and the world had been ontologically purged of transcendence. Transcendence is obviously is God's differentiation from the created order. And because that was a problem, obviously, that we couldn't communicate with God, but there's no relation there, this now kind of brings God tied back into the world, and God is no longer transcendent. He is mainly imminent in his creation. But we would hold to that God is transcendent because he's imminent. He has to be everywhere. And so those two have a, have a connection that ultimately was, was divided in this debate. <clears throat> Science, therefore, does not need to take this God or scripture into account in its efforts to come to terms with the natural world and can rely on experience alone. Experience, that's a big thing. Materialism, it is true, also draws upon ancient atomism and epicureanism. These are branches of philosophy where atomism thought everything was obviously, like I said, very, very small parts of atoms. Nothing was, nothing was immaterial. Everything was physical, was material, right? And then epicureanism, was a way of thinking, uh, philosophy right after the time of, of, um, of Alexander the Great and, and Plato, right? So he basically was a materialist in his metaphysics and everything was about, um, again, nothing immaterial, right? Everything was, was, was empirical, everything was material, and ultimately it was about really how to attain pleasure uh, for oneself, and ultimately it was a way of you can get sick, uh, all kinds of weird stuff, but ultimately it was really a way of, of looking at the world and, and going back to the, I create my own, my own reality, even the way of not being fearful of death and all these different things, like conquering your fears and, and that kind of thing. So anyways, get back to it. That was a little footnote I had there. Okay. This new understanding of becoming or change, the manifestation of divine will, is the ontological foundation for the self-consciousness of modernity. Since Plato... Being had been understood as timeless and unchanging presence, right? That's what we see that God is all the alpha primitives, right? So he is unchanging. He is uh, immutable, impassable. He's uncreated, right? He's all these different things. And so be becoming God is not like that static way of, of seeing God. <clears throat> change was always a falling away from being, degeneration. So basically we would look at change as God was, is being corrupted at some point, right? Because God is unchanging because he's perfect. He's pure act. He can't get any better, any more wise, any more powerful than he is. Any kind of change is a degeneration or a corruption in the being of God. So nominalism called this notion into question with its assertion that God himself was not only subject to change, but was perhaps even change himself, itself. Now we're talking about itself. The changeable cosmos was no longer seen as a falling away from perfection, no longer merely the moving image of eternity, as Plato put it in the Timaeus. Change was not simply degeneration, and change could be good if change were guided by an enlightened humanity that could produce good through it. But mankind, individually speaking, could not accomplish this good alone. Science, therefore, was a group enterprise aimed at mastering nature, thus mastering the natural world. Time to get into some of the key thinkers in the rise of modern Enlightenment rationalism. So Francis Bacon, 1561 to 1626, a scientist known as the father of modern science, rejected realism. And then realism is a mindset that universals have a separate reality from and exist outside of the mind. It's important. Of course, Kant and the modern thought all these things were in the mind, thus we create our own reality. So although the proposal goes back to, to Plato, it became theologically important in the Middle Ages as a, as a heated debate 
emerge between realists and the nominalists, right? Nominalists, things are just mere names. Realists say that these things are real. So these have they're, they're these, uh, they maintain these properties. Like, for example, whiteness is a property of, of snow. That's a real thing, right? That exists independent of our thought, just as, just as trees do, as this light does, right? So whether I'm here or not, if this light's here, this light is actually here. I don't just create the light in my mind. It is actually there. Let's see. Okay. He only saw, okay, this is back to Bacon. He only saw that physical bodies existed doing individual acts. Immediate experience served as the primary means to knowledge, right? That's empiricism. <coughs> Excuse me. Bacon believed that the progress of science would stalemate because of man's cynical outlook, deceptive senses, and limited duration of existence and influence. Therefore, a proper foundation needed to be reconstructed upon which science, the arts, in human knowledge could anchor itself. Uh, Bacon was not interested in understanding the, the causation, causality of nature as the scholastics did. Rather, he was interested in understanding the character and motion of matter, a mechanical, efficient causality. There's a little karate move there. <laughs> so, I'm thinking mechanical. Um, he wants to know how nature works in order to better the human project. In order for humanity to survive, thrive, and dominate the natural order, a material order, knowledge of how it works puts mankind back in control over his own destiny, no longer held hostage to the nominalist, tyrannical god of nominal scholasticism. So you see, we're back at the point again. It's about putting man in the driver's seat. So instead of speculating, he would say, about formal and final causality, right, that's the ancient way of thinking, which focus on what is a thing's purpose and nature as the investigation of being examined. Now, purpose and nature is, a, is, is a, again, it's the ways of causality of a thing's purpose, of a nature, what it has, what its purpose is, what it's made for, so why it's created, the material it's from, and ultimately what its ultimate end purpose is supposed to be, its final causality. So it's formal, right, what it's purpose for, and final is what it was created to do. <laughs> So Bacon, in modern science and philosophy to follow, their interest was in chain causation. If A does B, then C results, right? That goes back to the mechanical way of looking at things. Bacon's aim then was to understand and comprehend nature as power, no longer at looking at the world as a static system, but rather as a dynamic whole that interacts with all other particulars within it. Bacon had laid the foundation for radical advances in mathematics and philosophy, which Galileo Descartes and Hobbes then erected the walls. Now, while Galileo moved the motion into abstract geometry, widening man's understanding of mathematics, Descartes and Hobbes' alternative perspectives on modern science became a fork in the road, providing two main lines of thought in the modern project. In the version of Descartes, we find Leibniz, Mailbranch, Spinoza, Kant, Fichte, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and most contemporary continental philosophers. Now, we're not going to really get into those guys. We're going to talk about Descartes and Spinoza later on. But again, I have much more to cover, which we'll get to later on in my, into my lectures. Uh, following Hobbes, we have Locke, Human Mill, and other Anglo-American thinkers. Both lines of thought intended to provide an alternative outlook than what the nominalist God framework offered. It is fascinating to see the theological import behind these dreams of thinking. The catalyst behind the rise of the modern project is man's kind's desire to escape the implications that come with a nominalist God worldview. Now, if you see here, the problem comes down to misunderstanding God, right? So obviously a nominalist God is not the God of the Bible. And because this became the, the worldview that developed out of a speculative way of thinking out of the philosophers of the age, I mean, obviously there goes back, they're part of the Roman Catholic Church, but this view that became projected into society is the view that mankind is trying to escape from. And I don't, I don't blame them. I don't, I don't want to be under the anomalous God. I want to take control of my own, of my own future. All right. Rene Descartes. So the French thinker, Rene Descartes, 1596 to 1650. So he developed a method of mystic, of best, oh gosh, sorry, my jaw's hurting. He developed a method of investigation rooted in mathematics and yielded certain, that yielded certain absolutes. And these absolutes, he believed, would put man in control of nature, making man the immortal lord of creation. His application of mathematics sparked an interest in other philosophers to apply to all fields of knowledge, which is what analytical philosophy is. I got a footnote. What do I have? Oh, never mind. Okay. 
Hmm. Such methods preferred precise, quantifiable data to serve as the medium for accepting something as real in the universe, right? What we call that empiricism. So basically, if we can't quantify it, right, if we can't touch it, we can't sense it, right, it can't be real. All data is reduced to empirical data in which every hypothesis requires empirical proof, thus reducing all reason to mathematical reason. Key to this development of thought is that universals do not exist. One cannot deduce that the sun will rise again or that nature will function in a uniform way because one must empirically see it does when it does. Knowledge is only perceived through the senses, right? No universals mean nothing is constant. Reason for Descartes was autonomous. In accepting the autonomy of reason, epistemological initiatives pushed theology into a corner and theologians began adopting a rationalistic philosophy through which they were to acquire eternal truths apart from divine revelation. So that's two sentences right there is hugely important. And what do we hear, right? The theologians pushed into the corner by what the world says, you better adopt or you're outdated. So what do they do? They move away from divine revelation, right? Because why? Divine revelation can only be received if God reveals himself, right? And because now we see that mankind's in control of the natural order, God is no longer this transcendent being, divine revelation has no place in religion, in science, in, in, in politics or anything, right? Man is now at the center of the stage and man determines what is ultimately right and good and real and true. So Descartes defines wisdom as not only prudence in our everyday affairs, but also a perfect knowledge of all things that mankind is capable of knowing, both for the conduct of life and for the preservation of health and discovery of all manner of skills. <clears throat> Man, therefore, through his own will, is able to master nature. So you got a footnote here, anything good? Uh, no, okay. Man is, man is made, oh, man, man has made, man is made autonomous subject, in a sense replacing God, becoming the possessor of all knowledge, and man is self-creating and self-sufficient as the humanist ideal espouses. Descartes devised a technique, or devised a technique he called a method of doubt, in order for an individual to arrive at the first principles of knowledge. These principles were foundations of certain knowledge that the individual, under intense scrutiny, could hold to without any doubt whatsoever. From this method came the Cartesian principle, ego sum, ego existo. I think, therefore I am. You probably have all heard that, right? What this means is that if one recognizes the connection between thinking and existing, then one will never be deceived as long as he exists. And also, one is led to see that his existence is not possible apart from the existence of God, thus God is necessary and he is not a deceiver, and therefore one can conclude that the material world exists. So again, we don't have God completely out of the picture, right? But it's a whole way of looking at metaphysics. And that has been the that's been the, the word of this entire study, right? Metaphysics. It's having the right metaphysics. Excuse me. Um, so Descartes held to a universal sameness of matter, which operated under universal laws that govern the changes that take place in the universe. These laws replaced Aristotelian final causes. I'm sorry, I struggle saying that world that word. Aristotelian final causes, and together with Descartes' application of mathematics to the understanding of natural phenomena, facilitate the prediction and control of natural processes. Mastery of nature was the aim. Therefore, the scientific endeavor sought to understand the relations of cause and effect within the within the mechanistic system view of the world, right? Mechanical metaphysics. If humans understood what causes what causes produce particular effects, then human beings could be the masters and possessors of nature. For example, if we want to make rain, we need to know the cause that produced it. Nature for Descartes then becomes a clockwork mechanism. Because of the strict emphasis and subservience to reason, faith was then detached from reason, marginalizing it to the point that a later, highly influential thinker in the Western world, Immanuel Kant, devised an ethical system grounded purely on the secular foundation 
Descartes established, becoming the ethical standard in contemporary philosophy and theology. And with this paradigm shift, the emphasis on the voice of reason within, rather than the voice of God from above, set the stage for the orientation to eminence characteristic of modern theology, which we will look at in more detail later. Footnote, let's see, anything? No, okay. Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679. He too, a nominalist thinker, leaned toward empiricism. Oh, excuse me. For Hobbes, man was a piece of nature, a body in motion. Motion was not determined, rather it was mechanical. Therefore, man controls himself by his own impulses. Impulses. Apart from any divine teleological end. So what is teleology, right? It's about purpose, ultimate end purpose, finality, that kind of thing, right? Man, according to Hobbes, controls by just mere impulses, right? Here, now, in the moment. Not some type of divine end that I've been uh, my, my, I've been formed for, right? Man, man makes his own decisions. However, this is interesting. According to Hobbes, man is not free, though. Rather, he lives under the constraining forces of the material world. Knowledge is attained when something outside of us moves and causes motion inside of us. His strict determinism, again, and this is what a lot of people think determinism means. When we say that we are determinists, we have to define it by saying we are theological determinists, right? We are not material determinists, but the problem is when people hear determinism, they think of the cause and effect type of, of thing. So basically something hits me, I'm determined to hit something else, right? Just by the nature of cause and effect. But that's not what we'd say from a standpoint of theological determinism. Anyways, all right. So, um, so everything is already determined. So nothing can be done to earn or lose salvation. Again, he was still a believer in that. Uh, but obviously a very, very uh, flawed belief. But with the motives of glory and beatitude no longer functioning as an impetus for human action, Hobbes sees that man will become man will be more naturally inclined towards preservation and prosperity, with violent conflicts becoming few and far in between. Unlike Descartes, Hobbes sees man not as a transcendent being, but as an object to his chief desires to continue on his prescribed course with the least interference from others. Like Descartes, Hobbes sees, seeks to make man the lord of the manor, the possessor and governor of nature, in order to fulfill his desires. So the central aim of modernity... Descartes and Hobbes, similar to Luther and Erasmus, debated over the freedom of man and the determined causality of nature. So both different views, but both kind of in the same arena, right? The question that was resurfaced was, could these two coexist? And that was the aim and goal of modernity, to make man the free master of his own world. Now again, it is a theological problem. At the heart of modernity was the battle between who has ontic priority, ontic mean ontology, right? God or man, it is a metaphysical problem. But in the end, man's sinfulness ends up having the upper hand. Though it is really a suppression of the truth and blindness to the fact that God is in control, no matter what secularism thinks. And therefore, the ontic turn was a turn away from man and God to nature. One strand of enlightenment thinking viewed man as gods, while the other saw man as mere bodies of matter in motion. It was not possible to affirm both as many attempted because they were mutually contradictory. The earlier debate, humanism and the Reformation prior to the emergence of this movement, centered on the extent of divine power which remained in the circles of the faith. In the later debate, necessity of nature functioned as the substitute for the omnipotent predetermining God not grounded in faith. Rather, it was a necessity to be taken as an a priori truth of reason. A priori means a self-evident truth. <clears throat> but the problem didn't go away because a metaphysical reality still existed that could not be transcendent. And the Enlightenment era showcases, the Enlightenment era showcases modernity's inability to transcend its mechanical metaphysics. So it never really advanced past what it attempted to do, or it wanted to do. So human, humanism and the Reformation didn't solve the issue. Therefore, modernity attempted to make nature the ground as humanity makes an ontic revolution in metaphysics, seeing everything through a naturalist lens. And the contradiction of this worldview had disastrous ramifications culminating in the reign of terror, which is the French Revolution. As mankind could not be free, 
because of the corruption of the elite, which goes against the general will of human freedom. More thinkers arose to advance the rationalistic philosophy, but we'll look at these individuals within our discussion of the Reformed Orthodox within the rationalistic movement. So, the theological metaphysical problem that humanism could not answer is grounded in the question of the one and the many. And we're going to talk more about that in later discussions. The one and the many has a past that goes back to the time of Plato, who could not solve it. In fact, no one could. It is a quest to determine what is the absolute foundational truth of all existence. Now, obviously, we can solve that problem, the Trinity, right? The simple being of God in the Trinity is those two brought together. And, it, and this, this foundational truth of existence is the question of all philosophy. It is an attempt to explain the world either through one without reference to the many or through the many without reference to the one. It goes back to really what came first. That's the ultimate standpoint, is what is the foundation of being? Is it many things, or is it one thing? Nominalism rejects realism in its inclination toward the one, making it a disjunction between God and creation. But in making such a stark contrast between the two, resulted in a great emphasis on manyness and particularity. Now that pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, I know it's a little bit truncated at the end, but this is really the kind of the movement, the the later stages that we're in now, modernity has is, is become what it is now, which is why there's also a resurgence back to classical theology, getting back to the ancient way of thinking, which, I mean, ultimately it was the right way. I mean, the thing about it, the, the, one of the reasons why we know it's the right way is because the truths that we hold on to, the doctrines of the faith, were established from this metaphysical framework. And so again, if you try to change the metaphysics, you have to change the doctrines that came out of it. And so going back to that way of thinking is what we need to be doing as Christians. So anyways, hope that was helpful and uh, take care. Bye.